Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the annual general meeting of the Labour Movement for Europe 2022. Um, as you might notice, you seem to be an awful lot of me in the room, and I'm delighted to report to you there's only one of me. So if you have joined using a link from us, me as chair, please do change your name to reflect who you are so that we know everybody's made it into the room who wants to be. Um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We hope we're going to have both a productive and exciting AGM. I set our standards high as the chair of the Labour Movement for Europe. Um, we're going to start this afternoon with our debate, our, our AGM debate. Before I do, a couple of bits of housekeeping for you. First of all, you will have noticed that this event is being recorded. That means that we can share the debate. I have to admit, I don't think we'll probably be sharing the, the discussion afterwards on our Facebook so that people can hear some of the discussions that we've been having. If anybody does not wish to be identified, please do turn off your camera now. Uh, otherwise, when you're asking questions, we would ask that you identify who you are and, and say who you are um, so that people can follow along in the recording. Um, secondly, when we come to the debating process, please put your hand up using the reaction buttons on Zoom. I appreciate after two and a half years, of pandemic and using Zoom. Still, there are some challenges with it, but I hope that's a relatively straightforward request. We will be using the chat to provide practical information for you, but we won't be taking questions from the chat. So if you want to ask a question or make a comment, please do use the reactions buttons. If anybody has any concerns about how to find the reaction buttons, please do put that in the chat. And either myself or Ellie, please give everyone a wave, Ellie, who is our campaign coordinator, uh, or Jampy, who's our Secretary, who is now, I think, trying to find the reactions buttons on his phone, will try to help you. Uh, then finally, just quickly, if there are any apologies for this afternoon's AGM, please do put them in the chat. I know that Jampy will be listing some first. Uh, apologies, somebody seems to have screen saved. That's not very helpful. <laughs> okay. Without further ado then, I'm going to introduce our three speakers. Um, our first speaker for me actually needs no instruction. He wants to give everybody a welcome as our honorary president. I must tell you all that as a, as a young, excitable 18 year old, I volunteered for the Fabian Society for a year and the highlight of my year, as I rang and told my parents with great excitement was that I'd made Neil Kinnock a cup of tea at a Fabian conference. So to be able to introduce him now, my 18 year old self is absolutely overwhelmed. Neil is going to say a few words of welcome and then we're going to have our speakers, Polly from the Guardian, Polly Toynbee and Rory Stewart, who's joining us from Jordan. We're very grateful for. Um, please bear in mind two very important numbers. 2,154, the days since the Brexit referendum, it was, now a long time ago. 848, the days since we left the European Union, the days in which we need to make sure that there is a strong Labour voice speaking up for what should happen next. With that in mind, I can think of three no finer people to give us some ideas to kick off our debate. So I'm going to start by asking Neil to kick off. Neil. Thanks very much, Stella. And can I welcome everyone, including of course, Polly and Rory. Uh, can I congratulate you, Stella, on becoming our marvelous new chair of LME. And I also want to congratulate Jampi and Ellie and all the others responsible for bringing about a major increase in our membership over the last 18 months. Now, to get to the question, what should Labour say about Brexit now? I think they should give the facts. The facts about the manifest and intensifying real bills for Brexit. And they should also put the blame for those bills where it belongs, on the Tory government, not on the voters. The bills are high and rising, although almost entirely ignored by the mainstream media. They are and they will be increasingly evident. And they are central, and this is vital, central to the cost of living crisis. Brexit bought, brought the weakening of international and national confidence. 
It brought non-tariff barriers and impediments to trade, particularly red tape and movement costs. And it brought a weakening of our currency. The results include a fall in foreign direct investment, which is very severe. In 2016, FDI accounted for 4% of our GDP. It now accounts for 1%. It meant that sterling has been devalued by 14.9% against the dollar, which of course is the world's energy currency, and by 7.9% against the euro. 53% of everything that we import, 28% of our food comes from the European Union. Now devaluation is usually intended to produce uh, a fall in export prices and a rise in import prices. But of course, because it's come to us through shambles and not through any strategy, it's brought all the negatives and none, indeed less than none of the positives. The result is, according to the Office for Budget Responsibility, Osborne's creation, exports and imports are down by 15%. And according to the London School of Economics, UK-EU trade relationships are down by 33%, mainly affecting small and medium-sized enterprises, which of course are said to be the backbone of the British economy. The effects of all this, the loss of investment, the devaluation means that according to the OBR, productivity is down 4% and GDP growth is down 4%, less than the pre-Brexit uh, trend. Now, we heard during the referendum campaign, it's your bloody GDP. It isn't. For every 1% fall in growth, there's a nine billion pound reduction in government revenues. 4% loss in growth means that 32 billion pounds less is available for the NHS, for social care, for education, policing, prisons, parks, libraries, all indeed of the vital services that rely on national investment and expenditure. The Tory excuses for all this are, of course, the Ukraine war. Every single one of those negative features predates the war in Ukraine. There are other excuses. Inflation is global. Well, that's partly right. But the reality is that our inflation rate is nearly 2% higher than Germany. It's 3% higher than France and Italy. Adam Poston, the uh, economist of the respected Peterson Institute, uh, an economic and uh, an analytical institute, says Brexit is the primary driver of the high and widening inflation differential. We are being hit harder by inflation than any comparable economy and it's because of the bundled Brexit. Labour, in plain, understandable language, must first expose the realities of that bungled Brexit. It must challenge the Tory excuses. It must show that a closer relationship with the single market is vital to combat underperformance and inflation. And it must make clear that nobody, nobody voted for a cost of living crisis. Indeed, they were told that it, Brexit would result in a trade boom and in lower prices. The voters cannot be blamed. So what should Labour say? Fight inflation with lower costs, not with higher prices and higher taxes. Thanks.
Fantastic, Neil. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. That was fantastic as an opener. Um, our next speaker, apologies, I should have said as well that we were going to turn on the live captioning. So if anybody else has any other access requirements about participating in this meeting, please do let us know. Um, but they should be coming up now at the bottom of your screen. And it's a reminder to all speakers that we need to speak slowly enough for the captioning to catch up, which is a good test for me, if nothing else. Um, <laughs> our next speaker is the fantastic Polly Toynbee. I think Polly has been a voice of reason and sanity across our newspapers and now across our internet for generations of us. And I'm <laughs> delighted that she's been able to join us. I'm going to un unmute you now, Polly, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stella. Um, it's great to, to, to be here and, and it's great to be talking after Neil, one of the politicians I admire most of, our, of my lifetime. Um, Labour is, I'm afraid, very silent on the question of Europe. Um, you hear hardly a word. It seems to terrorise the cabinet at the moment. Um, and uh, the question is, well, to what extent are they right about that? It's easy to see why. Uh, the one, probably Boris Johnson's last hope and those of his um, extreme Brexiteers is to turn the next election into a culture war, but particularly to return to Brexit. So any hint that Labour is going to uh, make Brexit a big issue, they feel is uh, absolutely meat to their cause. Um, they can turn Labour into you know, parody of Ramonas and Romaniacs and all their other terms of, of abuse. Um, so I don't think there's any question that anybody in Labour is going to be calling for a new referendum after the experience of the last referendum, I hope never to see one again. Um, I don't think at this moment either that you can actually talk openly uh, or for, for a little, for a, quite a long while about returning to the single market or indeed to the customs union, despite the fact that Boris Johnson himself during the referendum campaign and in writing immediately after it said, uh, of course, we wouldn't be leaving either of those. Um, but that's all been, that's all been forgotten. Um, I think the fact that single market still involves mm, uh, freedom of movement still makes it very difficult, but it's very encouraging to see in the recent report this week uh, from uh, British Future that attitudes towards immigration have changed markedly since the referendum, that people are much more pro it, they much more understand the good that it's done this country, and that the shortage of labor really matters and particularly the shortage of particular skills. So that's become sort of less scary to talk about than it used to be. Uh, there are very uh, encouraging signs that in most polling for quite a long time now, people have been saying they think Brexit was probably a mistake, but that's not a huge shift, not the sort of shift you would kind of bet another referendum on. And now that we know how they run a referendum campaign, uh, we know that uh, the amount of lying and dishonesty would still make it pretty hard to win. Uh, Labour has instead gone for the slogan, make Brexit work, which probably for those of us in this movement find uh, a bit excruciating. Point is Brexit doesn't work, never could work, never will work. It will always be in all the ways that Neil has described, very damaging to this country. But I think it's not a bad first step because there's an awful lot that can be done to make Brexit better. And I think Labour could be talking more about that. I think each of the members of the shadow cabinet in their own field could be making more of a thing of what, the ways in which Brexit has been interpreted, which is doing damage in their particular uh, aspect. I mean, half, hardly a week goes by in which the sort of figures that Neil produced aren't uh, displayed prominently in the Financial Times, indeed in the Guardian and one or two other places. I mean, this week, the uh, Britain fell out of the top 15 car makers, and that's mostly due to Brexit and the damage that Brexit did. Um, as Neil said, HMRC this last month pointed to a 33% fall in trade with the EU, which is devastating. I mean, imagine if that had been a fact that had been there at the time of the referendum. I think people are understanding in one field after another, the tragedy of 
being outside horizon of our scientists being excluded. What a disaster that is. Uh, the loss of the medicines agency, when we in this country have relied a lot on the strength of our pharmaceuticals industry, has been a tragedy. Uh, tragedy of the loss of Erasmus. My lovely daughter-in-law came here on Erasmus and stayed, and uh, we're very grateful for her and for Erasmus. Um, there are things that Labour can call for without being very, uh, without having to sort of cross a line, such as we could rejoin the European Environment Agency, we could have a seat at that table. Nothing is more important than the state of the environment. Nothing matters more than that countries work together. We should be back in there with Europe at that table, agreeing common standards with them and being a leading voice in that if we possibly can be, but at least at the table. I think business is much too quiet and cowardly, and I don't quite understand why the CBI doesn't talk more about this. There are so many business people who are really suffering as a result of Brexit. Um, interestingly, the farmers, not usually sort of friends of Labour, have been speaking up a lot more. Minette Batters of the uh, Farmers Union has um, been very vocal about the terrible effects on British farming and the bad effects of new trade agreements that may undercut our farmers. Um, we're going to have real problems with the Shared Prosperity Fund, which looks as if it's not going to be nearly enough, not enough to substitute for the European funds that went to our disadvantaged areas, nor is it clear that money is going to be directed uh, immediately on inequality questions. Um, it has never been more important to see European unity than now, yet we're about to go into a trade war if we tear up the, uh, the protocol, if we... If, if, if we effectively uh, destroy the Good Friday Agreement, if we then make enemies of America as well as of Europe, this is poisonous stuff, poisonous for the people of Northern Ireland, but for everybody in Britain and indeed for European unity, couldn't matter more than during the Ukrainian war. And um, I think there is some hope now that people really see that, that they understand that uh, geography really matters. Our nearest neighbours really matter to us and we to them and that a Labour government in future can talk about being much better friends, much closer, without having to cross a line that seems to say, we are going to upend the referendum, which I think still, probably for quite a few years time, is dangerous turf and uh, people would regard as undemocratic. But within that framework, there is an awful lot Labour can do and they should get on with it and stop being quite so fricked. Thank you. Thank you, Polly. That was great. Um, can I just remind people, if they haven't as yet, please do change your name to reflect who you are. It's the three dots to the right-hand side of your uh, icon photo on Zoom to be able to do that. And also to say, so Rory is now our final speaker. If you want to ask questions or make comments on what you've heard, please do use the reaction buttons at the bottom of the screen to put your hand up rather than the chat function. So we're not looking at the chat function for questions. Um, our final speaker, I'm really delighted that we could get Rory along. Um, I worked with Rory in Parliament. We didn't always agree. Sometimes we had full frank and free discussions, but I also hugely respected him. And frankly, I really believe the Conservative Party are, are lost without him right now in, in Parliament. Um, he's, he's not actually in the UK at the moment, but he's made time to be with us. So I hope that everyone will give him a warm welcome. Um, over to you, Rory. Hello, everybody. Thank you for, for having me. I'm speaking to you from Amman in Jordan, so I hope it's a relatively clear line. Um, and and this is, it's a great privilege to be with you. I'm not sure I'm very qualified to, to talk on this subject, but let, let me just put out a couple of thoughts. I think, like I guess most people on the call, as I suspect, like everyone on the call, I, I have my own particular views on what we should have done during the Brexit events. But I do think it's extremely important to disentangle what we personally think the correct policy on Brexit might be from the bigger question of what uh, Labour should be advocating for at the moment. So from my personal view, I thought that the best solution would be a soft Brexit. Uh, I favoured a customs union, and I also like the idea of using citizens' assemblies in order to generate ideas for a softer Brexit, or indeed to discuss the subject of Brexit uh, in general. But there are two big problems, obviously, with Labour saying that, or indeed saying whatever it wanted to say, single market or any other views that might be on this call. 
The first is we can't forget that those of us who were broadly speaking on the Remain or soft Brexit side found ourselves in the middle of the most incredible splits within our own movement. And that igniting those again would be very, very dangerous. Um, we all bear the scars of this. There'll be people on the call who felt very, very strongly there should be second referendum. Many people, many people who felt that we should have remained, uh, other people who campaigned for single market, other people who campaigned for customs union. And we do not want to see ourselves tearing ourselves to pieces again, I think, in that way. The second thing I'm afraid, brutally, as an ex-conservative, now independent MP, I'm very confident that the one thing that Boris Johnson would like is for the Labour Party to come out clearly for a particular version of Brexit. If the Labour Party would declare for a customs union, that would give Boris Johnson immense um, opportunities he would feel to start different forms of warfare and conflict. So my instinct is that Neil Kinnock is right, that the best way to approach this is not to define a particular version of Brexit, but instead to talk about a bungled Brexit. And as Neil and Polly pointed out, there are any number of things we can point to, in particular the devastation at the moment that's becoming clear this week of the automobile industry, the impact on farming, and of course, most horrifying of all the potential impacts in Ireland, uh, particularly in relation to the Good Friday Agreement. Um, but to conclude, I do think that it is also very important to understand that the number one thing, if we want to get rid of Boris Johnson, must be fundamentally around the issue of integrity. I believe very strongly now that if we're going to win this and achieve anything that Labour wants to achieve in terms of a better settlement on Europe, it is absolutely central to campaign on that issue, to campaign on enough is enough, to campaign on we can do better, and to understand that everything that we're seeing at the moment tells us that his biggest vulnerability lies there. Okay, enough from me. That's extraordinary. Thank you, Rory. Wow, right. Plenty to get your teeth into, whether it is Neil and his argument that nobody voted for a cost of living crisis while leaving the European Union, Polly and her charge that businesses are being cowardly about talking about Brexit, or Rory and his bungled Brexit. If you would like to ask a question, please do put your hand up and please also make sure that you are listening to yourself rather than me to say that will confuse things immensely. Um, I'll take them in groups of three. Can I ask for brevity from both the speakers and the questioners so that we can get as many of you in as possible because I can see lots of people are interested in speaking. Um, and I'm also going to go for gender balance because just because we've left the European Union doesn't mean we should leave those values. So I'll start with Vicky. If I can unmute you, please. Hello there. I understand the difficulties that Labour is, is struggling with in terms of what its position should be and how to articulate it. But does the panel not think it would be a good idea, firstly, to stop talking about Brexit, which is divisive, and talk about Europe? And secondly, instead of adopting a position themselves to say what we really need is to have a public debate on what our relationship with Europe should now be. And I think that would help to kind of bring people together rather than tearing people apart. Thank you, Vicky. Nice and succinct as well. You've set the bar for people. Uh, I'm going to go for Councillor Andrew Brown. Can I ask you to unmute yourself, please? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a farmer and the, uh, the whole point of the CAP was to provide a secure food supply for 500 million people throughout the EU. We've seen our self-sufficiency in the UK drop to about 58% and we've got agricultural inflation now at 30% but I'm being paid to take half my farm out of production. Their whole farming and food and environmental policies is utter madness. What, what are Labour going to do to support our farmers and raise our self-sufficiency? Brilliant. Okay, and in our last question, I will go to Philippe. Can I ask you to unmute? And that just lets you know that in the next round of questions, I will be asking for two women. Thank you, thank you very much for choosing me, Stella. And uh, lovely to meet everyone. I'm Philippe. I'm a new Labour member, actually, and a new LME member. Um, I'm based in Brussels. And my question is, do you think that Labour should become more active, even though we're outside of the EU, in, for example, Party of European Socialist movements and become more engaged in European policy, despite the fact that we do not make it? Or should we try and remain sort of 
bit more isolationist as we become since the Brexit referendum? That's my question. Should we remain a bit more attached to the groups uh, that we've sadly, of course, been sidelined since 2016? Brilliant. Okay, I'm going to start with Polly. Um, feel free to take any or all of Vicky, Andrew or Philippe's questions, Polly. Thank you very much. I thought Vicky's point was absolutely terrific, completely right and very, very succinctly put. Uh, to talk about Europe, not Brexit. When we talk about Brexit, we fall straight into the opposite camp. And I think that's a very good thought. And the idea of a national debate about a positive debate about what should our relationship be would be would bring the sides together. So I think that's great. Uh, Andrew, I don't know the answer to that. I'll leave it to Stella because she's the Labour MP. Um, Philippe, yes, of course, we should join. I suggested we should join the Environment Agency, which we could do, the European Environment Agency. Uh, I think we should. And if there's anything else we can join in, then of course we should. Fantastic. Rory, can I bring you in now? Uh, well, so let, let me just take the niche issue, which is I thought it was a very good point made about farming. Um, one of the tragedies, of course, of Brexit is that in many ways, uh, French farmers farmers throughout Europe were, were very, very good friends to British agriculture. And the Russia-Ukraine situation has raised this extraordinary question around global food security in a way that we haven't really thought about it since the Second World War. When I was a minister in the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, it was very standard to say that Britain didn't need to worry about food security anymore. And I'm afraid we're now moving into a world which is going to become more fragmented where there will be more pressures and where we're going to have to bring more land into production. And I think our relationship with Europe and the common agricultural policy is quite a useful way of thinking through how we could do that. Fantastic. And last but not least, Neil, can I ask you your thoughts on the three questions? Particularly, I wonder if you could address um, Philippe's point about the institutions of Europe that perhaps we haven't been as active in in previous generations, but maybe we need to now. Thanks very much. First, I agree with, I couldn't hear whether it was Vicky or Nikki, uh, but uh, she's absolutely right that we should talk in terms of Europe and relationships, not only relating to economics, of course, but relating to political uh, implications of our separation and also to put an emphasis on security that comes from a close relationship with the rest of our continent. That links up with the point that Rory made in response to Andrew, and that is that we must demonstrate that food security requires an integrative relationship with the European Union, and not simply a focus on our own self-sufficiency. As far as Andrew is concerned, my recommendation to the Labour front bench is listen to farmers in a way that in, a, in history, Labour has never properly listened to farmers' farming interests, farming insights and proposals for farming action. That is absolutely crucial. There's a new constituency to be built there, which is being alienated by the Tories' attitude towards agriculture, and to British production and to food security. Finally, with Philippe, uh, he's absolutely right about our uh, direct political relationships. In this, of course, the Labour movement to Europe is leading the way. Our connections with the Party of European Socialists, uh, thanks largely to Giampi and the initiatives he's taken in the last three or four years, those relationships are close but they need to be reflected from the top in Labour so that our activity in and relationships in the Party of European Socialists becomes central to our identity. It's not a matter of compensating for Brexit. It's a matter of absolutely vital international solidarity and comprehension. Thank you, Neil. I shall take three more rounds of questions. I'm going to start with Julie. Good morning from Washington. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> um, I was going to ask, actually, um, you, Stella and Rory, whether you've had any conversations with, you know, private conversations with Brexit supporting Tory MPs 
and whether they've expressed any doubts about just what a disaster it is and how it's going, and any that we could encourage to speak out rather than being accused of rolling out the usual so-called Ramonas. Um, because I think we need, we just need some more supportive voices out there that actually are going to admit that this is a disaster. Um, and I don't know if Polly has any connections in, you know, amongst journalists who have previously been very Brexit supporting and whether now they're actually thinking it's time to speak out. Anyone we can encourage on that front? We live in hope, Julie, we live in hope. Um, Michael Elliott, can I bring you in, please? Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, I think one of the greatest tragedies of us uh, leaving the European Union is that had we remained, we could have played a major role uh, in all the problems that the European Union is facing today. And I think we'd have been respected for it. That's uh, patriotism, I think. It's not insignificant that only Ireland, small country of Ireland, uh, speaks English uh, as a native language. But the English is used in almost every meeting of the European Union uh, and its um, um, various offshoots in all directions. Question I want to ask is why, when the, we, we were, um, when Brexit came in, when the government enacted it, uh, we were promised that workers' uh, rights and other uh, human rights provisions would be reenacted in English law. I see very little signs of that happening at all, uh, rather the reverse. Um, I hope that Labour in the Parliament will be really raising this very strongly. Um, Polly mentioned uh, the Erasmus programme, something I was very much involved with as a European MP in developing it. And here again, um, British young people have been denied all the benefits that the Erasmus programme uh, offered to them. Um, so I think we should be highlighting this and I'd like to see um, more done by um, Labour MPs in highlighting these uh, failings of the government to protect uh, the benefits that we had as members of the European Union. Thank you, Michael. And last but not least, Elizabeth Goodburn. Can I ask you to unmute? Thank you very much. Um, yes, no, I'm not now. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. I just want to talk about this link between freedom of movement and the single market, because people seem to sort of put that together as being a disadvantage of the single market, whereas um, as far as I'm concerned, um, it's a real advantage and the loss of freedom of movement is something that's been an absolute tragedy for huge numbers of British people, including large numbers of young people who are no longer able to work and travel and live in, in our 27 friendly neighbouring European countries. And I, so it's not just about have we got people to pick our strawberries and kill our pigs and things, it's about the loss of, for our people as well, the loss of freedom of movement. And that was never something that was really made a, a, a major thing and, I, and I, I'm, I'm surprised that people see it as a disadvantage of the single market to me it's an advantage thank you great thank you um, I'll go the other way around now I'll start with Rory your thoughts on the the three questions we've just had Look, let, 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 let me um, as the ex-Tory in the room just talk about this question around conservative MPs and Brexit um, one quite striking statistic is that in 2016 in the Parliament, 140 of the Conservative MPs had voted leave and 187 had voted remain, so about 55% were remain voters. The problem is the Conservative Party has now under Boris Johnson become increasingly a sort of mini UKIP. Today, the number of remain voters out of the Tory MPs is 145, the number of leave voters is 200, so there's been a, a flip almost exactly in the opposite direction. Um, it's now a predominantly Brexit party, and I'm afraid it is almost impossible to find anybody within the Brexit voters who are prepared, uh, even privately, to admit that they made a mistake. And this is, um, this is, I think, something that should be painfully obvious to all of us who went through the pain of the referendum itself and all the division and polarisation that followed, that this remains so politicised, so deeply entrenched, and isn't really open, I'm afraid, to statistics about economic performance. It, it gets caught up with people's notions about control, notions of sovereignty, 
and indeed their own egos because they voted in a particular way. So I'm afraid wherever we go, it's not going to be realistic to expect uh, Brexit voting Tory MPs to start coming out attacking Brexit at the moment, unfortunately. I'm glad you were the one to deliver the bad news, Rory, rather than me. Uh, Neil, can I bring you in, please? Yeah, first of all, uh, Rory's absolutely right to draw our attention to the fact that the Conservative Party in Parliament, and more widely indeed, is now a kind of mini UKIP, which means that they've surrendered intelligence as well as patriotism. And uh, that's going to have to change. If I can just make this point, uh, as Rory has reminded us in his podcasts with Alistair Campbell, the anti-European MPs on the Tory side a few years ago were regarded to be a lunatic fringe. They were persistent for nearly 50 years. And eventually, of course, they were largely responsible for producing the 52% that voted for Brexit, allied, of course, with an entirely distorting press and much else. What that does is, in one sense, encourage me that by making the argument now on practical grounds in the midst of a cost of inflation, a, a cost of living crisis, for a new and different relationship with the European Union, our appeal, our support for our arguments will grow. It worked for them, it can and will work for us. I just make that point very solidly. Michael, of course, is absolutely right about the emphasis that should be put on the impact on young people of Brexit and the way in which it's been completely messed up in the last six years by the Conservative government. That's why we mustn't take the youth vote for granted. We know what its majority disposition is, but we should keep on making the argument from the Labour front bench and from the leadership that youth requires that we form that new and different positive relationship. We must not take the youngsters for granted. And lastly, uh, Elizabeth's point on freedom movement is very interesting. It's against the background of the reality that despite the fact that uh, wrongful fears about immigration played a major part in that vote six years ago, immigration has not fallen. And some of the errors and some of the crimes, I put it that strongly, in the immigration sphere committed by the Conservative government really must be held to account. What we are getting very gradually from the Labour Party is the compilation of an intelligent immigration policy that can have wider appeal. And as people increasingly realize, as they are from the detail that we had earlier, that the kind of restraint on immigration the Tories uh, say that they've implemented is not serving the interests of our country. So let's make the patriotic argument for much greater freedom of movement, both to advantage British youth and British workers who need and want to travel and work and study in the European Union, and also put the case that the economic requirements of our aging economy, our aging society, uh, really need the inflow of able, young, fit, tax-paying, qualified Europeans. Well, I'm slightly worried, Neil, as to whether, um, if we have to be the ERG, does that make me Mark Francois or Steve Baker? But um, I'm going to ask a colleague <laughs> to come in now. Europe is so much greater <laughs> than those political dwarfs that uh, um, the response will be all the more endearing. <laughs>
<laughs> well, let me take up Julie's point. Uh, I'm afraid I haven't uh, met any Tory MPs of the Brexit fraternity who have crossed the line, or at least have said so in public. I imagine that in private, when they talk to business people, farmers or whoever in their own constituency, uh, they, they must come across a lot of people who've been quite shocked at the effects of what Brexit's actually doing to them compared to what they promised. I think the problem with, with the Tory party is that if they're going to select another leader, whoever stands will still have to pretend to be a Brexiteer. It will still be framed in that way. Uh, and the next leadership election, I very much doubt you'll get anybody brave enough or ha who has a chance of winning to stand up and say it was a mistake. Uh, you saw the way that uh, Jeremy Hunt had flip-flopped when he, he reached the last stage of it. Um, and I think that's a real worry because what, whoever does win after Boris needs to be the next Neil Kinnock. They need to be the one who actually rescues the Tory party, turns it around uh, and makes it face up to the disaster that it has brought on, on this country over the last more than a decade. And let's hope they find a leader who is duplicitous enough to pretend to be a Brexiteer and then afterwards starts to shake some sense into that party. I think we have had quite a lot of duplicity in our politics recently, Polly, but I appreciate your honesty that you're seeking it. Um, on that note, and I'm conscious that we say we're, we've got a, a cross-party audience today, but I'm going to bring in Mark from the European movement to ask a question. Mark, can I bring you in? Hello, yes, thank you very much. Um, as, as, as you've said, Stella, I'm from the European movement, and I think we need more Labour people in the European movement, so um, I'll post the, the link in a moment to the website. But my question is this. Um, we have heard a lot about how we need to focus on not alienating Leave voters in order to win back the Red Wall, and that might well be right. But how do we as the Labour Party make sure that we don't disappoint the 49%, and it is 49%, who say that they would vote to rejoin if there was a referendum tomorrow. How do we make sure that those people don't drift away to support other parties, Liberal Democrats, Greens, SNP, et cetera? Thank you. Well, I can think of no finer person to actually answer that question, let alone offer us some insight than my former colleague, who is a much missed person on our benches, which is Anna Turley. Can I bring you in, Anna? Thankfully, Anna is still with us as a member of the executive of the Labour Union for Europe. Thanks, Stella. Yeah, um, I'm not sure about being able to answer that question, um, but I want to pose a slightly different challenge. And, and it's great to see everybody and what a brilliant um, debate and discussion we've had. And thank you to everyone for organising this. It's uh, it's fantastic to have different voices from outside to, to challenge us as well. But um, I'm saying hi to you from Redcar, which is still, I'm afraid, was a 67% leave seat and still remains fairly um, <laughs> pro-Brexit. And we've got a big challenge. And that's sort of the root of my question, really, is because we all found that we reached the limits really as politicians of the effects we can have on changing people's minds. And particularly as with the challenge that Rory has set out about where the Conservative Party is, challenge we've talked about where Labour is and its willingness to speak up. We've got to get that movement from outside of politics. And we've the only time we've seen this government U-turn and uh, really feel the heat has been when there's been a sort of real movement and a real shift in public debate. So my challenge is how could, how, I look at things like the Marcus Rashford uh, free school meals or you know some of the real pressure around the cost of living that we're seeing. How can we get that sort of shift in public consciousness? And um, Polly mentioned the role of businesses and it was a, a perpetual source of frustration to me that business people would say to me quietly this is going to be a disaster and Anna you have to stop this but would never ever stick their heads above the parapet how can we get those businesses to speak up how can we get the charities the universities all the people that are affected by this to really start to use their weight and to shift that public opinion and that debate and push back on the weight of the media that is has, has already been pointed out one of the biggest challenges we face so in a way you know yes it's what's the Labour Party you know what's the future of the Labour Party in its position on Europe but really how can the Labour Party start to really shift that debate externally and work with par partners to create a proper grassroots movement and, and pressure out there in civil society that makes the government feel the heat in the only way that it can. Thank you, Anna. Uh, and last in this final batch is uh, Richard. Richard Scoos, can I ask you to unmute, please? Thank you, Stella. 
Um, it just seems to me that we need to follow through the consequences of our politics on this, that if we're saying that the prospects of rejoining the EU in the short term are non-existent, then we have a problem if we're talking about Brexit all the time as the grand event, as though it were still current affairs. Do we not need to consign Brexit to the past as a past event that we can't, we're not immediately looking to undo, but the way that it was done was very, very badly. We blame that on Johnson and the Tories. And then the position for the next Labour government would be to start to correct incrementally and in a small way the problems that that particular yeah. past event brought about. And then we've had examples in relation to Erasmus or problems that arise for the different constituencies that we know are really suffering from it, whether it's consumers, businesses and so on and so forth. So I think that we need to start shifting and of course then start talking about Europe. That's part of it rather than as a, uh, rather than Brexit as a continuing issue. And in that way, it, mm -hmm. I, I think the messaging might be shaped more, um, uh, much more in alignment with the political reality of where we are. Thank you, Richard. Right, I'll, I'll go to our final speaker and I'll start with Polly, if we can. Yes, Richard, absolutely agree. And very much what Vicky was saying, we've got to talk about the future of Europe, our relationship with the future of Europe, and try and uh, stop using the word Brexit at all. I think that's, that's very important to try to get people to say, all right, whatever you voted, where do you think we should go next? I think it's quite easy to see what Labour would do in power and how they would behave. The question is how you get into power and how you don't make Europe something that becomes an obstacle, but if possible, make Labour's attitude towards Europe a plus. Well, if Boris Johnson goes ahead and tears up the protocol uh, and starts a trade war with Europe, I mean, he makes the case for us, really. All Labour has to do is to say, here he is, breaking the international law again, breaking treaties. We are law, we are law abiders. He's uh, breaking the law. And I think that's a gift to Labour at that point to step in in a very constructive way about future relationships with Europe. And not that I hope it happens. <laughs> Rory, your thoughts on these questions and perhaps particularly yeah, Anne's point about how do we rebuild? You and I spent a lot of time talking about things like citizens' assemblies and how we rebuilt politics as well as the issues of Brexit. So your thoughts on that would be great. Yeah, but, I mean, I, so I mean, obviously, I, I just, just to echo, I, I do agree with Richard. I think Richard's analysis is right. And I think that that does mean, as Neil said, that we focus on the bungled nature of the way that they approached it. I think there's also, it's worth bearing in mind that there will be real goodwill towards Labour uh, were they were to form a government. I think people like Macron are so completely alienated by Boris Johnson and people will be looking to form a better relationship with Britain and that's a fantastic opportunity. Um, in terms of winning on Anna's question, I do think that the great gift now is Boris Johnson's completely shameless behavior, his total abuse of the constitution. And that, that may also be helpful for making an argument for a different relationship with Europe because he's so associated with Brexit that the more that he and his method of government is discredited, the more that particular Brexit deal is discredited at the same time because there's a direct connection between his dishonesty and shamelessness and the type of horror which he's inflicting on Ireland at the moment because of his refusal to be honest either with the DUP or with the Conservative Party or with Europe at any stage in this process. Dishonesty leads to bungling. Um, and then, of course, I do absolutely agree with you, Stella, that we need to build a new politics. And I think this is exactly the kind of issue for which citizens' assemblies, juries of citizens, were very, very well designed. It takes the some of the political heat out of Parliament. It gives people an opportunity to approach things in a more moderate fashion over time to get into the details of a very complex issue. So I, I would be very supportive of that. Neil, can I bring you in now for those three questions? Uh, Mark asks, how do we avoid disappointing the 49-50% uh, who want to rejoin uh, and tell that to opinion pollsters now? I think with them uh, and on every other issue, we've got to say and say and say again because the 10,000th time that we say it will be the first time that some people hear it. There is a Tory minority government 
there have been several Tory minority governments. If you vote for any party other than Labour, they will maintain a Tory minority government. So if you want to displace the Conservatives, get rid of Johnson in your area. Please vote Labour. And there's no other way around it. We otherwise get caught up in the bog, in the marsh of pre-Brexit deals and plots uh, with the Liberals and all the rest of it, which are distractions. Let's keep on putting the issue fairly and squarely to people. If they vote tactically, they will get a Labour government. If they vote with their first preferences, they will not get a Labour government and Johnson or somebody very much like him will stay in power. So let's put that directly. Anna's right. We have got to mobilize business, agriculture, universities, charity, opinion. I'd add the youth opinion. We have got to encourage any contact we have in all of those areas to speak up. They will do eventually, and they will do it long before any Tory MP admits to being wrong. The congregation of their opinions will have a direct effect, especially since it will be non-partisan in political terms. We're right, uh, or Richard is right, to say, let's consign Brexit to the past. It was six years ago. It's ancient history. People don't even realize that we've only really been out for a year. And in many respects, the constant extensions of arrangements so far as imports is concerned uh, has delayed that. I don't uh, beckon it forward because of course the results will be harmful as everything else has been. But if we really start talking about Brexit in the past and focus on what we need to do in and for the future, we will get a fresh hearing. Fantastic. What a, what a moment to uh, conclude our first half of our, our AGM on. I want to thank all of our speakers uh, today for basically challenging all of us. Um, as we said, 848 days since we left, but actually many more days since this debate began and the damage that started under the referendum was done both to our politics and to our relationship with Europe. So not a moment to lose before we need to get back into making those arguments. Um, can I ask everybody to give a virtual round of applause to our three uh, speakers? You'll see it come up on your screens, I promise you. Thank you, guys. Uh, and to thank, as I say, to thank Rory for, for dialing in all the way from, from Jordan, along yep. with Julie dialing in from uh, America. Uh, some of us are dialing in from East London. It doesn't feel quite as glamorous anymore, uh, as well as Polly and Neil. I, I hope... Uh, members have enjoyed that as a debate. I think there's a lot there to think about and a lot for us to decide about what we want to do next. One of the things I'm very keen on is that we make sure that we keep our meetings to time and we keep ourselves moving to time so that people know the time they give us to be active in the um, Labour Move for Europe will be well spent.